it's really a pleasure here to be with you tonight. I actually want to introduce my husband and my, my partner in this whole effort, and Dr. Kenneth Dernosik. He is the president of the Pueblo Guild, and so that's why I just wanted to give him a special introduction. And then also tonight, I'm going to be talking about our initiative in Africa and as well as how we can approach kids here. And um, I want to introduce you to our USA director, Mrs. Sarah Smith. And she's in Pueblo with us. So, so thank you so much. And um, I would like to open with a prayer that has been a prayer that I've said every morning since 2003 and it really helps me sometimes i feel overwhelmed with all we face and i think you'll see these words are are very good for that in the name of the father son holy spirit amen for his sake i am but one but i am one i cannot do everything but i can do something what i can do i ought to do what i ought to do by the grace of god i will do Lord, what will you have me do? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So this talk um, was born out of me as a physician, as a mother, as a wife, and um, it really began in about the late 1990s when it came up before our school board as to whether or not we would begin condom instruction in the schools or whether we would do an abstinence approach. And at that time, Ken, my husband, and I approached the school board and made a formal presentation. He is a specialist in metabolism and de development, and I'm a dermatologist, which I will explain to you, has to deal with sexually transmitted diseases. And we made a very good presentation about the importance of teaching our youth abstinence strictly from the medical standpoint. But the health department came in and their doctor made a presentation about why we had to just teach them to use condoms and that was all that we could do. And we did not win that battle. We're in a battle, but sometimes good things come out of not winning a battle. And what happened was it gave me the realization that part of the problem is that we doctors ourselves are not fully understanding the risks that are out there and specialties don't communicate as much anymore. And, but I was feeling also my own specialty had really neglected an area of skin-to-skin -skin transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, which is really one of the main reasons that the condoms fail. And so I thought, okay, I need to make a lecture for my colleagues. I'll try. And it's got to be evidence-based. It can't have any religious overtones. I was already viewed in town as being religious, so, which may have had something to do with the rejection at the school board. But um, even though I didn't speak from that perspective. And um, so I designed really... Um, an evidence-based argument for why we need to take a abstinence approach for our youth, actually even in the office, but as a society too. And, and lo and behold, it was accepted at the national meeting of the American Academy of Dermatology, and that first year was 2001. And it ended up not sunsetting like the workshops usually do at three years, but it went on for nine years. I titled it Teens and Sex, Reach Them Now or Treat Them Later. Those are the choices. And, and so then I built this case, which I'm going to present to you here tonight as so that you'll be able to also hear for those of you that are in practice and working with youth, how, how I approach it. Um, but I was asked to speak on chastity from the medical perspective, and I've been speaking on this topic for a long time. So, t 
Tonight, I've expanded it to try to look closely at chastity also from a medical perspective, because chastity is a little different than abstinence. And um, so I hope, that, I hope that I will be able to do a good job on this lecture for you. Now, one thing that probably surprises you is that I'm a dermatologist, okay? So you might be going, hmm, okay, what, what would she know about that? Well, the older ones in the crowd recall that I, our field was dermatology and syphilology up until 1955. And we, in fact, are known as venereologists the world over. And, and highly respected, I might add, um, because the needs in the world overall with uh, venereology are, are just endless. So what, what um, happened was in 1955, penicillin, of course, became in wide use. And so our, the main skin manifestation, the common STD that was around then, was syphilis. And so we came close to you know, eradicating syphilis, and the name was dropped to dermatology in 1955 for our academy. Around the world, you will still see the additional words on some of the other societies. But dermatologically, as sexually transmitted diseases, we have the key ones that are skin-to-skin -skin transmitted, and that is chancroid, granuloma inguinale, herpes, one that is still very much alive and well. There, there's, that's a, still a continuing problem. Human papilloma virus, that's the, that's the virus, of course, that causes uh, both cervical cancer and genital warts. Uh, lymphogranuloma venereum, that's a problem more in the rest of the world. And then we have syphilis, which is on the rise again. And um, then lice, molluscum, and scabies. Now, so I've come a long way in my Christian walk and my medical walk since the days when I was a medical student and um, had to pick pubic lice out of somebody's area and didn't think too much of it. And, you know, I've just taken a total about face on where we are with all of these diseases. So what happened was on the on the 2003 year, the second year of my presentation, the third year, I had been making this presentation and I always came to a point where at the end of the talk, I would get some dermatologists that would raise their hand and say, um, you've, you've really presented this case well, but you haven't really shown that sexual behavior can be changed. And what happened that year is there was a major report that came out of Uganda. And long story short, I ended up adding that to my lecture. And that year, we ended up going to Uganda on a grant to look at the HIV, the, uh, HIV prevalence reduction strategy uh, that was going um, on there. So what happened was that I gave that same presentation that I had developed from the failure of reaching our school board in Pueblo, I gave that in um, Makerere University for 400 people in Kampala, Uganda. And they were really wanting to hear this message because they were discouraged because they knew they had had an abstinence and be faithful behavior change success against HIV AIDS, but they didn't know too much about it, but they could see that the condoms were really coming back in. So very, very shortly, they, um, after I presented, they wanted to gather and, and do something for us to help them. Uh, they chose the name Universal Chastity Education. At that time, I didn't really even completely understand chastity. And, um, but they were very strong that that would be the name. And this organization, what has grown to an organization, originally we thought we were just going to get them pledge cards to go out into the field because they were using these commitment cards. This, this is Archbishop um, reti now retired Henry Luke Arambi of the Anglican Church, 
who was one of our very first endorsers in 2003. And this is uh, Michael Bahinoza, who was one of the co-founders from Uganda. And we have so many clergy that have supported it in these three countries and now have made 438,000 plus chastity commitments through these programs that the Africans do in, in, in um, Africa. It's, it's been really powerful. So what they taught me about chastity was that I hadn't understood that chastity is also something for marriage. And, you know, so it was confusing to me. So if some of you were saying, well, you know, I don't get it either, you know, you're not alone. So basically, I want to review chastity so that we can see how, how what, what we're teaching with regard to abstinence helps us build a paradigm of chastity. So from our own catechism, in what way is everyone called to live chastity? Christ is the model of chastity, and all baptized are called to live chastely. And that is within keeping of their particular vocation or state in life. So the consecrated the nuns who have taken vows and the priests, their job is to give themselves to God alone in, with an undivided heart. And those of us who are married, our job is to remain faithful from in our marriage and really to keep our marriage bed free of other things that pull us from chastity and that could be things like pornography or flirtation or any number of things and if we're single if we're living the single life we're called to practice chastity and continence which would be abstinence we live a life of abstinence and service to others so I, I would like to play this for you because I heard this a couple of months ago on the radio and it was powerful to me. Whether it's the one true God or any of the false gods du jour, we're going to worship something or someone. It's how we're made. Worship is in our DNA. The top three American false gods are money, sex, and power. There's nothing wrong inherently with any of them. But when they're out of order, they become profane, from the Latin word profanum, which means out of the temple, removing something good from its sacred context. Fortunately, the church has the antidote, the evangelical councils. To the unhealthy attachment to money, the gospel proposes poverty. To sexual license, chastity. And to unchecked power, obedience. Taking back the culture means saying yes and no to the right things at the right time time. This is Patrick Coffin at patrickhoffin.media. Be a saint. What else is there? He said it so well. And what did he really say there? He said sex was something good. When it's in marriage, the sacred context, and that saying yes to the right thing at the right time was really what we needed to do. I want to introduce you here to Dixon Tumarame. And in 2004, in the very earliest years of universal chastity education in Uganda, he was just a teenage kid who got it, a chastity card, signed it, and began the walk. He ended up working with the team and presenting himself over the next six years until he got married in 2010. I've never, we have never gotten a gift from a married couple in the many weddings that we've attended. But when we attended this wedding, we were in Uganda at the time, Dixon and his wife presented us with a gift. They said, right after the service, we're going to take pictures and we have something to say to you and we want it videotaped so the world can see. So world, let me introduce you to Dixon. I'm called Dixon Tomoramie, and here is my wife, Prim Tomoramie. We have had a very wonderful day today. 
together and it's because of what we have gone through. I want to thank God so much for universal just day, education, for the great work they have done in us. Personally, I have been abstaining and my wife too, she has been abstaining and it's because of the great work that the universal just day, education has done in us. I have been volunteering with them since 2004 up to today and I have been facilitating in various schools with Dr. Kim and Dr. Kane and other members of UCE and they have taught us how to live pure lives, healthy lives and I learned how to abstain until I get married which I have done today. And from today, I will no longer abstain, but I will live to be faithful with my wife here. And I want to encourage everybody that please, if you are still not yet married, you abstain. I abstained. It's a hundred percent perfect. I did it with my wife, and we have enjoyed the fruits of our labor. We thank God so much for that. And second, to the marriage, let's keep faithful partners in the U.S. and all over the world. I want to thank you so much for supporting UCE, for giving us funds, enable us to go out and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and of abstinence to everybody. Abstinence, oh yeah, 100% perfect. Now here's the beauty of this. Dixon and his wife in 2019 now have three children. They write and are interviewed regularly in Uganda as experts on the subject of Christian family life. The next stage of chastity that's spoken about in our catechism is the positive effect that we begin having on those around us. The catechism says, Chastity leads him who practices it to become a witness to his neighbor of God's fidelity and loving kindness. So what is seeking chastity? Chastity is found in Christ, the model. Purity of heart, mind, soul, and body. This also is from our catechism. It starts with purity of intention. And purity of intention is really, an example of it is when the youth decide to sign that pledge card. Now, it, this decision can be made in a person's heart, but there's something very distinct that takes on in, in, in these programs when they make that commitment, especially if it's made in front of their friends. And then, how do we battle the disordered desires that we are all having a tendency to. It's through the grace of God, number one. And that grace of God comes to us through prayer. And we have to have discipline. Discipline is the reason part. It's the mind part. It's what, what we in, begin to intact, in, enact when we choose abstinence. Now, some people may be sitting here and thinking, it would be expected, well, you know, can I go yet? You know, this doesn't apply to me. And what I want to say is, if you think this maybe doesn't apply to you because of your current life or your past life, let me tell you what we have seen that goes on in a country like Burundi, which I'm going to read you a testimony. The third poorest country in the world and people living in situations where they can't even afford the meager amount for school fees. And so they resort to other things in order to even go to school. And in, in our countries that we've been in, Tanzania, Uganda, and Burundi, the repeated phrase we will hear is, our God is a God of second chance. And we as Catholics certainly should be aware of that. We have that opportunity through confession. We get that forgiveness and we can go on. 
But here is a testimony, and I'm not going to read her name. She turned her name in to the team, and, um, but you'll see why. I started being a prostitute in 2007, when I was still 18 years old. I left school in Village and came down to hire a room here in Myogo, near Lake Taganika, where I could have enough clients from the fishermen. It happened that I attended a UCE open air meeting two years ago, I think. I laughed at those who signed commitment cards. But later on, I decided to sign it also. I joined the church. Now I am married legally, and God has blessed us with two children, and I thank UCE for the role played to change my life for better. So how does abstinence and chastity, how do they interrelate? This is, this is how it works. The virtue of chastity comes under the cardinal virtue of temperance. And we are seeking to permeate the passions and the appetites with our sense of reason, our reason, our rationale. And that requires self-restraint, self-denial, avoidance of, that requires abstinence. So chastity includes, the catechism calls it an apprenticeship in self-mastery, which is training in human freedom. Because once mastered, we are free because we're in control of our, all of those emotions. The alternative is clear. Either man covers his passions and finds peace, or he lets himself be dominated by them and becomes unhappy. So the medical perspective are really the reasons for abstinence. So what are these reasons? Well, safe, safer sex, it's called safer sex now, a, approach hasn't worked. And you know, we're, we're at 30 plus years with this. And these rates of all these diseases just keep going up. Abstinence is medically correct and it would meet criteria for best practice. Abstinence is realistic, which I'm going to demonstrate for you, and behavior can be changed. We know that in medicine. Sexual behavior can be changed. We found that out in 2003 in the major report that came out of Uganda. And not only that was behavior changed, but health was preserved, so with an ultimate consequence that was proof point. And it's ethically correct to inform our patients what is the best way to prevent these problems. It's the highest standard. And put in Christian words, it high standard is coming directly from God himself, and that is chastity. So in this battle we're in, and it is a battle, who really is at most risk for HIV, AIDS, and sexually transmitted diseases? Well, our youth, everywhere around the world, not just here, but everywhere in the world, every statistic shows that. And specifically, you're not hearing any more about AIDS, and I don't know why that is, because in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have nearly 37 million Africans that are living right now with HIV. And 37 in the world, and 70% of those are in Sub-Saharan Africa. The transmission there is heterosexual. And young people between ages 15 and 24 account for 40% of the new infections of HIV every year. And for example, in 2017, there were 1.8 million new infections in that year alone. So compare that to things like created a crisis around here, like Ebola, at 5,000 people. 
And of course, these are all tragedies when they occur, but, but 1.8 new million, million new infections per year. Here in the United States, we have 110 million people living with a sexually transmitted infection. And remember, that would be prevalence. And 20 million new cases in the United States yearly, and that's incidence. And half of those are in our 15 to 24-year-olds. This, this data came out in the latest in the latest uh, report from the CDC about where we were with the reportable STDs of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And if you can see there, I, uh, yeah, that projects all right. It's gone way up since 2013 as far as the number of cases in each, in each of these uh, um, infections. And this is costing our country and. $16 billion a year. That's what's been estimated for a long time. So what are we up against here? We're up against a number of things. One of the things we're up against is, I feel, a change in verbiage medically. It's kind of like it was called safe sex until finally we you know, kept saying, what's safe about this? And finally, the literature has begun to call it safer sex, as far as description of condom. Okay, now, an interesting thing is that everything is being called sexually transmitted infection, all right? And, and this is bothersome to me, because a disease means end organ damage, or it means living with for life. And so, you know, when we call these all sexually transmitted infections, does that sound as serious to any of us, including our kids or anybody, as a disease would? And yet, if you look at the literature, my term there, that's my descriptor, sexually transmitted disease for everything there in white because of the long-term consequences of those. Here on this side, the infections and infestations are all easily treatable. And so that's why I put them on that side. Technically, these of course are all infections, um, which is probably why they're, why they're doing it, but I feel it's less descriptive medically as to what people are facing. Um, it's viruses, of course, that are affecting people with everything from hepatitis to HPV that then they might have to live with for a long period of time. And, you know, we have all of the additional consequences of, um, of infertility from PID, from possibly chlamydia or gonorrhea. And so my opinion is that it, it negates the seriousness of what we're up against. Um, the ones that I've put in italics are ones that dermatologists would not deal with at all. Um, many of you would, I'm sure. And with regard to HIV, I don't treat HIV, um, but a dermatologist is going to be familiar with the various skin manifestations that they will deal with when, when they are actively suffering or moving towards AIDS. Um, all of these other ones we will see as a dermatologist, and I just, I, I want to just say that there are some trends here that are concerning and have a reflection in our culture, um, and that would be herpes, for example. I mean, you know, we don't have a vaccine. We have, we can get some protection with a condom from that skin-to-skin -skin, um, transmission, but um, we are getting a movement of uh, genital herpes always used to be type 2 and, and confined to that area. And now there's a definite movement of that virus as being herpes simplex type 1 on the genitalia. And of course, the theory is that that is coming from the alternative practices that are becoming very, very popular. Um, in our culture. And in fact, you know, what are some of these youth thinking? They're thinking that if they have sex another way,
besides the normal way, that they wouldn't get pregnant, um, that they actually think that they won't get a sexually transmitted infection. They don't understand that, HIV. Interestingly, this study showed that they also thought that they would be less likely to get into trouble, um, feel guilty, feel bad, have a bad reputation, and it would be more acceptable somehow, and, and also that maybe it wasn't really sex, and so that way they could stay a virgin. And the truth is that oral sex has all of these, all of these potential infections. So um, our youth are really not understanding things at all. So when we talk about abstinence, we have to be remembering that what are we telling or recommending that youth abstain from? And abstinence in just the sexual intercourse form that we might be thinking, or are we going to recommend abstinence in all forms? That's what we need to do nowadays. I mean, that from every form of sexuality. And how long until they're ready, which is what they will hear in comprehensive sex education courses, except when do you define ready? Does that mean till the next relationship? Now you're ready to have six, or, or maybe you're going to have it on Saturday night. You'll be ready then. Or is it going to be marriage? Their end point is not clearly defined. So in these programs that are called comprehensive sex ed, the type that Ken and I fought against way back in the late 1990s in our town, what we're dealing with, they call them also abstinence plus or dual message, but really, we've reviewed these curriculums and the, the extra message of abstinence is minute, it's minute. There's, there's low expectation for abstinence, kind of like if you could abstain, but who can? And you know, their goal is actually pregnancy and HIV prevention. That's what they're targeted for, which is why they tend to always want to encourage condoms because those two are, you know, protected from the condom because it's ejaculate delivered. So the problem is that most of them will imply that other ways will protect them from that. And we've seen curricula that actually recommend mutual masturbation as the stopping point. So these programs do not, no matter whether they say they promote abstinence plus, just a little plus, it's more like little abstinence, big plus. So what are the other types of programs? There are programs called abstinence until marriage or abstinence only. And those programs, of which we have very few right now because we haven't had funding for those for a long time, minimal, it, although recently they've been increased, but abstinence until marriage as a defined point. And they try to encourage the kids to understand that all types of sexual activity should be avoided. The truth about condoms, or shall we say condom failure, and that their aim is to prevent sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancy, and develop character. That's what they try to do anyway. Always comes up whenever you're talking to a parent, anybody, a colleague, anyone, what about condoms? Just give them condoms. And of course, that's what they do in Africa, in most of these countries. Um, so let's just talk about this so that you understand what the issues are with condoms. All right, so what I've got here is I've got a sentence that's true or false. And I've given it to you because our kids came to us. Now, I learned in school that condoms work 98% of the time. Okay, so all right. Where could he be getting that? So brings me the reference. 
And what the sentence read, and you can find this all over the internet for everything from pregnancy to HIV. When used consistently and correctly, condoms are 98% effective against fill in the blank. Is that true or false? Yeah, it's false. Okay, now what are the problems with this? So this is the big thing, I put it in red. Consistently and correctly. Multiple studies, I can't even put them all in this talk, talk have shown that real life use of a condom, which is all that really matters, means that people either use them sometimes all, most of the time, or some of the time, and that they always have both correct and incorrect use. Now, the reason you always will see these terms, when used consistently and correctly, is because that's the closest we can come to, to perfect use. All right? So in the laboratory, which is the perfect use, quote unquote, time, Condoms work 100% of the time, pretty much, for most of these things. They're, they're used correctly in whatever testing, and it isn't a problem. But the problem is that we as human beings cannot achieve that level of perfection that's really required for the various um, problems that people have using condoms. So this can be shown um, in other ways, too. So this, this is a chart that shows the difference in risk reduction against various sexually transmitted diseases, and this is among 15 to 24-year-olds, and these statistics here are from 2008. And if you look here, um, this was put together by the Medical Institute of Sexual Health, and if you look at the risk reduction with condoms, they have calculated based on the known data, what, what is the risk reduction using a condom if you have gonorrhea, 50%, chlamydia, 50%, syphilis, 30% to 50%. Again, lots of skin-to-skin -skin potential transmission in both first and primary and secondary forms. HPV, 60% re reduction, and HIV, 85% reduction. Now, I, I would state that most doctors even don't realize that condoms have 85% risk reduction. I want to point out something else here on this slide, and that is under HIV. Notice we don't have a lot of HIV incidents right now in our country, all right? But this is in youth, and in 2016, we had 8,451 new cases of HIV, and there's some concerns about this culturally. 17% of those new diagnoses were already AIDS at the time of diagnosis, and this is in 15 to 24-year-olds. 81% of those 8,400 some new cases were in boys slash young men from homosexual sex as their, as their stated form of sex. And of the 992 girls and young women who were HIV positive, 87% of those were from heterosexual sex so this idea that the only way you really get HIV is through, you know, drug use and needles, um, you know, if things are changing here. And what I'd like you to just ponder, this is my comment here, is what will happen if homosexuality and bisexuality in our culture increase? So this, these are the two primary sources for where they get that statistic about the condom effectiveness in HIV. Um, in 2001, there were 138 papers reviewed by a panel of 28 
experts who met to form a consensus statement. And what they said was that there was strong evidence for the effectiveness of condoms for reducing sexually transmitted gonorrhea for men. And with regard to HIV AIDS, they said consistent condom use decreased the risk of HIV AIDS transmission by approximately 85%. The Sexually Transmitted Disease Guidelines of 2015, which are actually our most current ones from the CDC, because they come out about every five years, states that in heterosexual HIV serodiscordant relationships in which condoms were consistently used, HIV negative partners were 80% less likely to become HIV infected compared with persons in similar relationships in which condoms were not used. So what are the choices out there for our sexual lifestyle? Well, we can have a worry-free life if we choose abstinence until we have chosen our lifelong partner. That is called mutual monogamy in medical terms. So we are not going to get any sexually transmitted diseases by basically following, now going back to the Christian perspective, what God intended for us in our sexual life. Mutual monogamy with an uninfected partner, of course. Probably in the United States, our most common uh, sexual lifestyle choice, or perhaps it seems to just happen, is serial monogamy. So what is that? That means you know that we have a partner, maybe in high school, it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, and they have sex, they break up, they go to college, now they move on, and they meet somebody new. And they have a new partner, boyfriend or girlfriend, and then that breaks up, and then they meet their spouse, and they maybe marry them, that's now their third partner, and then maybe that ends in divorce or what have you. This is probably in our country our most common pattern. The riskiest pattern is what I have called all of these different names. Um, when I was growing up, this was called promiscuity. But when I gave this talk once, I was told I was not allowed to use that word anymore. I put it back in because it, it, it says something to me about where we are with the culture. We're not allowed to call things what they are anymore. The, this is an example of multiple near simultaneous partnering. And that's what got Africa into trouble, was the acceptance of infidelity, of polygamy. It was culturally accepted that, you know, you might have a family there you're supporting in that town and maybe another one there and another one over here and everybody knew it, everybody accepted it and apparently it was even pretty well accepted in the church. It was just the way it was. And that is called concurrency. And so in Africa you have concurrency with all trusted partners. And so HIV comes in to one group and pretty soon they've all got HIV. And that's the theory for why it exploded in Africa. So there, then there's polygamy that we might think of here in this country where somebody actually does marry multiple wives and they all live together. Um, and anonymous partnering is the term that's used in the homosexual culture. Hooking up is now the term used in the college culture. When our kids go off to school, they've got to be prepared that there are going to be kids that are just, you know, hooking up. One night stands, I think we used to call them. And then, of course, prostitution, which is now called sex work. So why do we want to teach everybody abstinence as doctors? Well, because we, leave, we believe in health. So don't we care about the health of the skin of the genitalia? How about the reproductive tract? How about emotional health and preservation of life itself? The Centers for Disease Control actually says on their website that with regard to prevention of HIV, abstinence is the only 100% effective HIV option. Big yes. And then they explain what abstinence is. 
It's what I said. It means abstaining from oral, vaginal, or anal sex. And an abstinent person is someone who's never had sex or who's had sex but decided not to continue having sex for a period of time. What is that called? The kids talk about secondary virginity or being a renewed virgin. They, they made a mistake. They're starting over. They've chosen virginity. Then with regard to teen pregnancy pre prevention, the CDC on the website says abstinence from vaginal, anal, oral intercourse. It's the same statement. It's a 100% effective way to prevent HIV, STDs, and pregnancy. And again, our STD treatment guidelines from 2015 actually state the same thing, the most reliable way to keep yourself safe. So it gets us down to, can behavior be changed? Well, I would hope that as physicians, we believe that behavior can be changed. We certainly have seen successes with alcohol-related automobile deaths, child bicycle helmets, seat belts, tobacco awareness and cessation, whole communities that stop smoking. We've really had success in that area. And what is it? It's avoidance success, okay? Not risk reduction. We don't encourage people to just reduce their re risk. We in encourage them to stop that in quite a directive way. So does physician advice matter? We know this also from the CDC, yes. Patients who received physician advice on diet and exercise were significantly more likely to engage in risk reduction activities. So yes, doctor, what you tell patients does still matter. But then why this? So in 2004, a survey was done of nearly 3,000 clinicians who were asked about dealing with adolescent patients. And here's what they said. This was with regard to HPV. They said 96 to 97% of them said that they were not, condoms were not 100% effective and could not prevent skin-to-skin -skin transmission of HPV in the areas not covered. True, 77% believe patients will not consistently use condoms. And here's what they said. 90% of them said that they always recommend condoms. What about abstinence? 91% of these clinicians said that abstinence was highly effective. 94% of the patients believe that their patients will not abstain. And only 54% recommend it. So what really is best practice if you look at criteria for best practice? So that began thoughts for me is that do we have a worldview problem here, just us even as physicians? When we don't model the proposed behavior change or maybe when we didn't model it, does it become more uncomfortable for us to endorse it or recommend it? Just a theory. But I would propose this, we are still ethically obligated to give the best known medical advice even if we have not modeled that behavior in our life. So that caused me to do a study in my practice. This was in early 2000, about 2000 to 2004. And my question that I wanted to answer was, can abstinence instruction be comfortably incorporated into a teen medical visit? And can it be time efficient? Because as a dermatologist, that was really important to me. But I really wanted to solve this problem because when they come in and have that by the way, when we're trying to see a lot of patients and it turns out that they've got something on their area and they hate to mention it, but they're very worried about it. And now all of a sudden, you have almost an hour appointment every time because of all of the secondary issues it brings up that, that need to be discussed. So I figured, are patients or parents offended by my abstinence instruction? That might be a way to measure, you know, if it was received well. So the measurement would be, would they return after receiving my advice? 
pretty simple. So what was my advice? One sentence. You can consider lifestyle abstinence, which is a choice that you can make to not have any form of sex until you choose your lifelong partner. And you know what? It's never too late. You can start now, and it'll prevent you from getting all sorts of different diseases that I have to treat you for, and it will help to keep you healthy. That was how I said it. That's called a directive approach. And those of you who are out there in practice right now know that directive approach is really not you know, encouraged. It's kind of like that bothers me because we're doctors. People come to get our advice. So, you know, I mean, yeah, some open-ended questioning, but these are kids and their parents and they want to know how to stay healthy. So, so basically what I did was I had that way of approaching and I approached every kid the same way, whether they had green hair and earrings in their nose and everything that was quite surprising for me at, in those earlier years. And it was interesting that those kids sometimes were the most responsive. And you know, so you just never know which kids are going to receive this. And what essentially happened was that I measured this, I compared follow-ups to the year and a half before, how often did people come back to see me? And so my, that was my control group for both follow-up patients, existing follow-up patients, and, ex, and then new patients. That's these two columns. And, and basically, the statistician, my data showed that they all came back at, at in the same proportion of times. It looks like they came back more when I talked about the abstinence, but that he said that wasn't true, it wasn't statistically significant. So this is the conclusion that I was able to draw, that teen patients, whether new patients or follow-up, whether male or female, who were given that instruction in abstinence were at least as likely as those who were not instructed to return for follow-up. Their continued care was apparently not inhibited in a way by, in any way by the abstinence instruction. Abstinence instruction can be easily and comfortably incorporated into teen patient visits, especially acne visits. So how about from the perspective of the kids? Is abstinence realistic? Because that you get the two questions. Well, it's not really realistic, and what about condoms? And so those are the, t the two key questions you will get from everybody. So this is interesting. The virginity movement, which really is present, okay, now, now here's the hope, okay, that there is this core of kids, and it began right about the time I was getting all frustrated, at the year 2000. And some of you may remember, Newsweek actually covered the new virginity in 2002, and Miss America took this in 2003 as her platform. Uh, she was very much criticized for that. They actually tried to take away her crown for that. I incredible. But that was her platform to be that role model. Well, here's the hope. 17 years have gone by, so do the math. These millennials right here probably have kids approaching adolescence. And you can be sure in their domestic home, their parents have told them their story and have recommended abstinence. So I think there's going to be a continuing core of these young people that will be coming forward just because the movement really is present. I neglected to say that when I did my little study, every now and then I had a couple surprising answers, you know, like the kid who, after I have this you know, just what I told you, very short little session with them. And the mother and the kid are walking out, the mother's first, the kid, the boy, turns around and says, my mother needs your lessons. <laughs> that one threw me for a loop. So I just let them go, so I hope mom got her lessons there. And, and then I remember another distinct one, it was, it was a girl who the mother, uh, you know, she, the girl, the mother said to me, Doctor, you know, is this realistic? That's common. Is this realistic? 
And the girl, I didn't have to give my explanation about how many STDs or anything. The girl herself said, Mom, chastity is cool. So you just never know what kind of response you're going to get. And look at this, virginity pledges. You can look at celebrities since that time who have been regularly proclaiming that they really have been trying to remain a virgin, and many of them have succeeded. Hey, our greatest success is apparently engaged now. That's Tim Tebow. And you know, more power to him. He's really been great for this virginity movement. He's 31 years old, and he is a proclaimed virgin. We had early on the Jonas Brothers, where all three of them wore chastity rings, and, and Two of them were successful until age 20, and one was successful until marriage. And then we have all sorts of other newer celebrities, many of whom I'm not even familiar with, but they've made this statement, they are waiting to have sex until marriage. And I think that's inspiring to the kids who are on media. But here is what inspires us as doctors. Okay, in 2009 and on, the NHANES study, which you know those are the broad national studies that look at youth behavior. They do them every two years and they're highly trusted for all different things because they sample large cities, big schools, poor small schools, all different schools all over the country. And every single year the number of kids, this is the way it's reported in those every two years, so this is the current one, ninth to 12th graders, 39.5% of that age group have ever had sex. Okay, now they define sex as vaginal or anal or oral, which is really a big statement because what that means is that you reverse it. 60.5% have never had any of those forms of sex, i.e., they're virgins. So things are not as bad as we sometimes feel they are. There are population groups of teens also that are, are greatly at risk by their lifestyle. The other thing is what do the kids themselves say? And they stopped doing these surveys. They were done by the National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. And they did them year after year after year. I've got every year there in parentheses. But the, the seniors wanted to give important advice for high school freshmen regarding this topic. And 92% of them thought that they would tell them, it's OK to be a virgin when you graduate from high school. 85% of them said it's best to wait until after high school to have sex. 93% said you don't have to do anything sexual that you're uncomfortable with. And 91% you don't have to have sex with someone just because you've done it before. Now that to me is hopeful. Peer talking to peer, encouraging each other. And this single survey question which they repeated from 2000 all the way up intermittently to 2010. They've just stopped doing it anymore. But you can see, is it important to have a strong message from society to abstain from sex until you're at least out of high school? Well, 87%, 93%, 87%, 91, 94, 92, you see it. That's what the kids said. They want to hear from us, from society. That means parents, doctors, other kids, they want to hear, what is that? Is that natural law? Is that natural law? Surely those kids are not all Catholic and probably not all Christian. So can sexual behavior be changed? Here is the proof point. Uganda had the most significant decline in HIV prevalence of any country in the world. And that still has not ever been achieved by any other country. What was their strategy? Basically, what they said is they had death all around them. When you are at a 21% HIV rate, in some areas 30%, they told us you're basically going to a funeral every week. 
and you end up on your knees a lot and you start to think what do I need to do to change and live? These are exact quotes that we heard. We also heard when we were there that no, abstinence, be faithful, stop. That's the way so many of them said it. When asked about what had been described to the world as the ABC, abstinence, be faithful, condoms approach, they said abstinence, it was abstinence, be faithful, full stop. That was the other way of emphasizing. And many of them said the real C. And what we say with universal chastity education is it's ABC, abstinence, be faithful through Christ. The first lady got on board. So you see multiple parts of society got on board, not just the doctors, not just the politicians, not, not just the radio commentators, but all of them did. And this was the first lady, and she made this broad statement. Young people must be taught the virtues of abstinence, self-control, and postponement of pleasure and sometimes sacrifice, and teaching them a different lifestyle will ensure their survival. And in fact, this was the report that I found and didn't even know where Uganda was when I found it. Ken had to find it for me on the map. And this was a report to USAID called What Happened in Uganda. It was published in September 2002. And what you can see here is that in the Idi Amin and post Milton Obote years, which is like late, 1980, late 1980s over into the early 1990s, the Westerners were required to leave because it was unsafe and all the agencies were gone. We will never probably ever again have such a pure model of actually a primary behavior change that was not influenced by condoms. The condoms came back in in 1995 when it was safe for the Westerners to be back in the country. And this was the original, the original chart that showed this dramatic reduction in both Kampala and in uh, the rural areas of the HIV prevalence among women, which is thought to um, be the reflective of the HIV incidence. So this was later substantiated when the reports came out about actually how many condoms were in Uganda during those times. And this is published by Douglas Kirby, who put these statistics in here. And I will say that, you know, Doug, Doug, Douglas Kirby has been one of the main proponents of comprehensive sex education, but this is his data that he published. And so what I did is I just did a little condom math. So this is Ken, Kim's condom math on this. So if you look at the population of men in Uganda, age 15 and over, they at best had two to five condoms in a single year that any condoms at all that were available where in a year where there were any condoms available. That was how that mapped out. And so that was extra proof very tangibly that the condoms were not there. The most scientific proof is the study by Stoneburner and Lobier that got published in Science Magazine in which they actually clearly demonstrated that in both males and females, urban and rural, the numbers of males and females having sex with more than their regular partner decreased. This is all before 1995. And the numbers of youth age 15 to 24 who never had sex, i.e. abstained, increased. And you can see that right there. And all areas except rural where they already marry very young. This is a capstone to this, although it is not as scientific as the previous, but just look at this data. Botswana has never 
taken an abstinence approach. They didn't have the PEPFAR money, and they've never adopted it themselves. Uganda has really struggled to stay with the abstinence, be faithful approach, even though condoms have really, you know, come into their country too, but they're resolute people. And we see here in 1991, Uganda had the highest rate of HIV, actually even before that, in all of Africa. And Botswana at that time only had a 3% rate. Okay, Uganda took on AB, abstinence be faithful, Botswana took on the condom approach. And when measured for that report that was cited by USAID, Uganda dropped to 5% in 2001. Meanwhile, back in Botswana, they had increased their HIV prevalence to 36%. And to add emphasis to this, Uganda has really continued to really promote abstinence to youth and faithfulness in marriage to one partner. And you can see in 2015, they were at 7.1%, and 2017, 7.3%. Very pleased with that. Botswana, on the other hand, with a, still only a condom approach, has gone down a little to 22.2%, and then in 2017, 22.8%. So we need a paradigm shift, or do we? What is our current approach? Risk reduction, Uganda's risk avoidance. We have a Western strategy heavily promoting condoms, vaccines, and treatment as the strategy. And Uganda is still following their Ugandan chain, strategy of behavior change. It's a single strong message that everybody tries to give. We give a dual message. We presume abstinence is not possible and are very quick to say, if you can't abstain, there's condoms in your drawer. Ours is assumptive in that regard. We assume the kids will fail at this before we've even tried to encourage them. Theirs is evidence-based and best practice. I would say that ours is suboptimal advice. When we began this initiative of universal chastity education named by the Ugandans themselves. This particular man, Michael Bahinyoza, taught me a lot about chastity. And I did not understand why he didn't want it called universal abstinence in education. But anyway, he said, doctor, because this is more than abstinence. Abstinence means saying no to something that God created as good and right when it is used as he intended in marriage. Chastity is for all, that's why universal. It is saying yes to all of God's ways and in more things than sex. It is saying yes to all the noble ways of living as modeled to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why Ken and I were so struck that this was like a light coming from Uganda to all of us, to the world. Because what does that sound like? Later on, when I became Catholic, I realized that sounds like it's right out of what I showed you in the catechism, doesn't it? So chastity is the answer. It is the answer to HIV AIDS STDs. The answer to teen pregnancy is chastity. Abstinence is part of chastity. It's a required step we must take with our reason. Faithfulness in marriage is part of chastity. The answer to pornography is chastity, seeking chastity. The answer to abortion is chastity. The answer to vocations is chastity. We've had now three three of our young men since 2004 who have chosen vocations 
in UCE. St. John Paul II's theology of the body is chastity. Chastity is a virtue. God wants the best for us. The best is chastity. And I'm going to close with words directly from an African. This is sent in to the Washington Post by Sam Rutakira, who at that time was Uganda's National AIDS Prevention Committee chairman. And he was upset because in 2008, they were going to withdraw the PEPFAR funds, which included abstinence and be faithful money for Uganda and many other countries. And so he wrote to the Washington Post and they published it. And this is what he said. We, the poor of Africa, remain silenced in the global dialogue. Our wisdom about our own culture is ignored. Telling men and women to keep sex sacred, to save sex for marriage, and then remain faithful, is telling them to love one another deeply with their whole hearts. Most HIV infections in Africa are spread by sex outside of marriage casual sex and infidelity. The solution is faithful love. So hear my plea, HIV AIDS profiteers, let my people go. We understand that casual sex is dear to you, but staying alive is dear to us. Listen to African wisdom and we will show you how to prevent AIDS. Thank you very much.